morning, everyone, and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development Winter Crop Talk Series. If you have any questions today during the presentation, please type them, as always, into the questions tab on the go-to menu, and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. This presentation will be recorded, and we I will send a link out to the recording uh, later today. And with that, uh, Lionel, you go right ahead. Hey, thanks, Laurie. I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, the February 3rd uh, edition of Crop Talk. Um, today we uh, are looking more of uh, what we can expect and maybe some of the new uh, uh, insecticides that are coming out for uh, for the spring. And uh, we're uh, happy to have uh, John Gavoski on to give us the, uh, the insect update. And uh, again, it's uh, something where we're starting to get some questions from producers uh, and uh, there's going to be some time for questions at the end. But uh, again, so uh, thanks, John, for being here today. And Laurie, if you pass the screen over to John. OK, th thanks, Lionel. Uh, as, as Lionel mentioned, uh, really a big part of my presentation today is going to be recapping what happened in 2020 and uh, where I can trying to forecast uh, what might be on the horizon for uh, 2021. Uh, as well, there were several new insecticides that uh, came onto the market over the past year for insects such as uh, flea beetles, wireworms. So I do want to touch on some of those as well. And I'm also going to cover a couple insects that really aren't currently pest problems in Manitoba but they're newer arrivals, and particularly into the western part of the province. So they're insects that I would like people to at least be looking for, and if you do start seeing them, to uh, collect a sample and uh, get them sent in so we can track their population. So that's really what's on the agenda for today. My biggest goal, though, is to make sure questions that you have get answered. Lionel emailed me several questions already that people have submitted to him. And I've tried to cover those the best I could in my presentation. But if the other ones come up during the presentation, uh, please feel free to ask. So getting into what were the big concerns from last year, I've got what I call my top four. There were, there were really four insect, insects and insect groups that were widespread and I'll call them major concerns last year. And those were your flea beetles and canola, Army worms, and when I say army worms, I'm not talking about Bertha army worm because that really wasn't a big issue. Uh, this is some people call it cereal army worm or true army worm. Uh, it's the one that likes to feed on cereal grains and forage grasses. Cutworms were still a big issue, and grasshoppers, their population seems to be peaking, or I hope it's peaking, maybe it's got more to go yet, but it, populations have been growing over the last few years. Maybe that's a better way to phrase it. They've been growing and getting to some um, quite damaging levels. So we'll cover all these for, predict where we can, and talk about new control strategies. I'm gonna start with flea beetles, just to recap of what happened last year. So last year, pretty much all the seed, once again, treated with a neonic. Uh, the canola did not cooperate in the seedling stages. In many cases, uh, after seeding, the plants sat in that seedling stage for quite a long period of time. And there was a lot of other things affecting the canola other than just flea beetles. There was dry conditions, strong winds, crusting issues, uh, frost damage in some areas. A lot of things that were holding the canola in that vulnerable stage for a prolonged period of time. And really, that's what causes uh, these, I guess, more severe flea beetle years. What, if you get a year where you seed the crop, it germinates quickly and it moves to that three to four leaf stage within, say, two to three weeks, you're probably not going to be having to do fully your spraying or very minimally. Uh, last year wasn't like that, and that's what resulted in a lot of the full year spraying. And I do know of quite a few situations where people were reseeding canola because of either flea beetle damage or a combination of flea beetles and other insects. So, um, again, it's partially luck of the draw, what the conditions are like uh, once that canola germinates. 
Now, going into next year, trying to predict flea beetles is always a tough one. Um, we did have a fairly high populations on the canola late in the season in many areas. That can be a tip that the flea beetle population, at least going into winter, uh, was fairly strong. People tried doing research correlating uh, late summer and fall populations with spring populations. That research was attempted by Ag Canada. Oh, I believe that was the 80s, early 90s when they were doing that. Uh, it was quite a while back. The, their, their research really didn't provide a good correlation. They, I, they didn't really publish anything out of that. Uh, there, there wasn't a strong correlation. So there isn't a good model that we can use to somehow try to count flea beetles late in the summer and say this is what you'll get in the spring. It's really not that easy. But knowing that there were uh, decent populations late in the summer, it's good to at least be anticipating that the populations will be there and could be damaging should the canola be held back once again. So that's probably the approach you want to take going into the coming season. Now, as far as insecticides for flea beetles, you've got your seed treatments and then you've got your foliar sprays, which ideally you wouldn't have to be using, but in recent years, people have been a lot. So for the seed treatments, everything that I've got in black on my screen, those belong to a, a group called the neonicotinoids. So that's your, your Helix, your Prosper. Nipsit's uh, another version of Prosper. Sombrero is a midacloprid. Um, years ago, we had gaucho. That's not being sold anymore. But Sombrero is the same active ingredient. And I don't know that that one's uh, used too much. I think Helix and Prosper are probably the, the main two for seed treatments. Now, that's your basic neonic seed treatment. And I'll go over later what you can expect from that. I usually suggest somewhere around three weeks. Now, you do have these other products that are add-ons. They're not things that you can buy separately. You buy them combined with a neonic, and that's your, your Lumiderm, your Fratenza Advance, and Buteo Start is a new one. So I'll talk a bit more about that uh, later as well since it's a new product. So these are things that you can um, add on to your neonic for an extra cost that will give you either extra flea beetle control or some cutworm control as well. And I'll get to those in just a minute, which does what. As far as the foliar sprays go, uh, anything in blue is a pyrethroid. So they all belong to the same group, the pyrethroids. Um, people like to ask, what is the best product to use for spraying uh, flea beetles? Which is the best foliar spray? There is no easy answer to that one because I've heard growers tell me that they used a certain product and it worked good another person uh, tell me that they used it and they didn't think they got good control at all and i've heard heard that same thing from multiple of the pyrethroids so uh again there, there's four main active ingredients in our pyrethroids trying to pick a favorite is a real tough one because again uh depending on who you talk to you get an, uh, a different answer on which seemed to work the best in addition we've got uh, seven um Seven uh, should work well. Uh, it, it is a fairly high rate of seven that you need for flea beetles, so it is a bit more costly than some of the pyrethroids would be. Uh, Malathion is an option. I don't know if that's widely used. And Volium Express, so that's the one that's basically a, a combination of a half-rate Matador and a half-rate Corrigin. Um, Matador is already registered for flea beetles. The Corrigin component, Corrigin is very good on Lepidoptera, caterpillars and grasshoppers, and good residual. On beetles, in most cases, uh, Corrigin, you'll see the word suppression behind some of the beetles that it's registered for. Great product on Lepidoptera, great on grasshoppers. The Coleoptera group, your beetles, it, it's a, more, a bit more hit and miss. So Volium definitely is an option. Um, but uh, don't make the mistake of thinking because you have the Corrigin option in there, it's going to be a superior flea beetle control product. Uh, by chance, if there was diamondback moth or something in there, or uh, possibly cutworms you needed to control as well, then it could be a very good choice. But again, just don't anticipate that if we use that, uh, we'll have this long residual against the flea beetles because uh, you might find that's not the case. 
Now, as far as the um, flea beetles go and the seed treatments, um, not all flea beetles are controlled equally well by the seed treatments. And when I say this, I'm talking more specifically about the Neonix, your, your Helix and your Prosper. Uh, we know from research that you get better control of crucifer flea beetle than you do striped flea beetle. There isn't any resistance here. There, I mean, resistance implies a genetic change has occurred in the insect to make it less susceptible to the pesticide. And that hasn't occurred here. It's just uh, not, not all seed treatments control all species of flea beetles equally. And uh, it's just uh, the neonics control crucifer a bit better than striped. So there is this concern that we might be selecting for more striped flea beetles by using the neonic so heavily. And there is some data to back that up. Julie Soroka did some research on this. Uh, she's recently retired, but uh, she's produced some good papers showing that we probably do have a little bit of selection going on towards striped flea beetles, which uh, can be a bigger concern because, again, they're not killed as well by the neonics, which currently are our dominant group. Now, one of the questions Lionel submitted to me was, what are the benefits of going with a Lumiderm versus just one of your neonics? So uh, Lumiderm, it's a whole different group of insecticides. There's a group called the diamides, and that's where Lumiderm belongs. So it's a whole different group than your, your uh, Helix and Prosper belong to. Uh, the group tends to have some uh, decent residual and it's very good on Lepidoptera. So if you have a field where you're concerned about cutworms, you've had some chronic cutworm issues, uh, Lumiderm would potentially be a good choice. Uh, again, it, it, it does work very well on cutworms. I've seen some very good data uh, showing its effect on cutworms. I'm seeing firsthand how it can kill cutworms as well. So uh, works very good on the cutworms. With the flea beetles, you may get a little bit extra protection. You will get um, some control of striped flea beetles, uh, or at least better control of striped flea beetles with the Lumiderm than with just a, a single neonic. So if the stripes were the dominant species in your area, and you're concerned over that, that also could be of benefit. Now, the new one on the market is Buteo Start. <clears throat> so this is what we call a group 4D. The neonics are a group 4A. So it's the same number, but uh, has a different letter behind it. So uh, it, it works on the same site as the other neonics. So it's, it's targeting the insect in um, at, the, at the same location as a neonic would, but it is a different chemistry than the neonics. Hopefully that's clear. So it's, it, it uh, technically has its own group. It's not uh, considered um, a neonic in the same sense. There's a group called the butinolides that it belongs to. So technically it's not a neonic, even though it has the letter four in front of it, different group. Uh, if anybody's familiar with the foliar insecticide Savanto Prime, which is used probably more in horticulture, in potatoes and things, this is the seed treatment version of that chemical. Um, and with Buteo Start, it, it does have to be combined with Prosper or Helix. You're, you're not using it solely on the seed. Uh, and the, idea, the reason you would use this is to try to get a little bit of enhanced flea beetle control and potentially a little bit better control of the striped flea beetles. Now, uh, the, the neonics, the length of control you get can be affected by weather conditions. Uh, what I'm stating in this slide here is research that was done by Bob Elliott at Ag Canada in Saskatoon. He was looking at the effectiveness of control under different soil moistures and temperature conditions. And he found that they, the, the neonic seed treatments were more effective in the drier soils than one that was too wet. And they were more effective at the higher temperatures than at the lower temperatures. Now the moisture part of it, uh, neonics are quite water soluble, very water soluble. So if you do get 
some heavier rains after seeding, uh, there could be a dilution effect happening because of the water solubility. So if you do get a year that is wet and cool, uh, you may have less con less length of control than you would otherwise. So uh, you have to factor that into your scouting as well. Now the question, how long should you get out of a Helix or a Prosper? Again, tricky one because it depends on the environment. Uh, and you'll, you'll see different things advertised uh, in different places. Uh, Dr. Janet Knodel at North Dakota State University, she's done quite a bit of work looking at both seed treatments and foliar insecticides. And one of the things she uh, did do in some of her previous work was measure the length of control that they were getting. So here's the results of some of her work with Helix Extra and Prosper, they generally got about three weeks of control, maybe four if the weather conditions were not conducive to the flea beetle feeding. Um, and that's the amount of residual from the date of planting, not emergence. And that's the general guideline I've been suggesting to growers is expect roughly three weeks from the day you seed. Not the day you first see the canola above ground. The clock is ticking from the time you seed. So anticipate probably somewhere around three weeks from the neonic. If you've got a, a lumiderm or a buteo starter or something, hopefully you will get a bit extra control on top of that. But again, the uh, clock is ticking once you've seeded the crop. And other things that you could try to do just to minimize damage. Um, Lloyd Dosto did some work in Alberta years ago on seeding depth and seeding rates and how that affected flea beetles. And um, he found that increased seeding rates seemed to reduce the flea beetle feeding, which intuitively you, you would expect it would uh, for a couple of reasons. Dilution effect being one of them, more seedlings per number of flea beetles. Also, if you lose some plants because of stem clipping and uh, or just severe defoliation with a higher seeding rate, you do have a better chance of still having an acceptable plant stand. However, there's trade-offs uh, with increasing your seeding rate, one being the cost of the seed. And the other, if you get too high of a plant stand, you're probably more susceptible to certain pathogens. So uh, I realize flea beetles aren't the only factor that determines what seeding rate you use. And of course, seeding as shallow as available moisture will, will allow anything that you can do basically to get the, uh, the crop into that three to four leaf stage quickly will be helpful. And uh, one last thing regarding flea beetles. Uh, again, this work was done, uh, some of it was done in Alberta and some in Manitoba actually on reduced tillage and flea beetles. Um, probably the biggest study on this was the study by Lloyd Dostal in the late 90s where he had uh, plots that were conventionally tilled and plots that were reduced tilled and he was looking at flea beetle damage and there was a significant difference in flea beetle damage with there being less damage in the, the reduced tillage plots. So having some stubble, some trash on the soil, seems to create a, a microclimate that the flea beetles find less attractive. So preferentially, they will go to soil where you've got young seedlings coming up, but not a lot of trash. They like that open, uh, hot um, surface to feed on. For whatever reason, the, the trash, maybe it also made it harder for them to find the plants, but there was less flea beetle feeding where uh, people were using the, um, uh, the zero tillage regimes. And interestingly enough, I was on a, um, uh, listening to a talk yesterday from a flea beetle researcher in Sweden, and they've just finished doing some research which almost duplicated Lloyd's study, and they got the exact same result there that uh, in their zero till plots, not that there's a lot of zero till in Sweden, it's something that uh, some people are trying, um, 
but he, he noted that uh, there was a lot less flea beetle damage in their zero-till plots than the conventionally grown plots, although he did comment that if everyone was doing zero-till, it's hard to say whether you'd have that same effect. The flea beetles are still going to want to feed, and usually I caution people too about um, making too much out of this research. It, it is good and interesting research, and it does have applications, but even if you are doing zero till, uh, you still got to watch flea beetles because they can still destroy your field regardless. It's not a silver bullet. It's something that might be providing a little bit of help if you're uh, doing minimal or zero tillage, but definitely not a silver bullet. So moving on to cutworms, number two on my big four list here. Uh, last year was once again a a uh, fairly bad year for cutworms, but maybe not as bad as 2019. 2019 was one of the worst cutworm years that I've ever seen. Uh, massive problems in some areas, a lot of spraying in 2019. 2020, uh, a little bit less spraying, a um, little bit less severe, but still some major problems, and from all agricultural districts. So we still had some high populations. A lot of insecticide used once again, and once again, some reseeding, but not as much as 2019. So maybe populations are going in the right way. Uh, trying to predict what's coming for the flea beetle, or sorry, for the cutworm populations is tricky. They often do go in a cycle where populations will build, you get a few bad years, usually three or four uh, bad years, and then the population seems to drop. It's almost like a bell curve. That's often the way cutworm cycles work. What complicates it is when we talk about cutworms, there's different species. And I'm, I'm not going to dwell on this too much. I'm going to go back a slide. Last year, our two dominant species were dingy cutworm and redback cutworm. Redback is one of the clipping species. Dingy, less clipping, more defoliating. But my point is, we've got different species. So when we talk about bell curves and cycles, not all species work exactly the same. So when you have multiple species that are part of a cutworm problem, it makes trying to predict things even a bit more trickier. But I'm hopeful that we might be on the downward side of that slope, given that 2019 wasn't quite as bad as, oh, sorry, 2020 wasn't quite as bad as 2019. Um, but definitely, given that we still had some major issues last year, uh, cutworms are still one of the top pests you need to be scouting for going into 2021. Uh, people have tried to do research looking at can we predict cutworm populations based on pheromone trapping. They basically found it really wasn't a good and accurate way of predicting anything. So uh, again, we based things more on what happened the previous year and encourage timely scouting in the spring. That's still your best strategy. As far as management goes, um, do scout the fields fairly thoroughly just to get a sense of what's happening. Sometimes you will notice that the, the population of cutworms isn't in, in any way uniformly spread. Uh, we have seen situations where the cutworms were in very distinct patches in a field and this can occur sometimes based on what was growing in the field last season when they're laying their eggs in late August and maybe into September. Uh, they do like a little bit of nectar as well. They're a moth that's trying to feed. So if you've got, uh, say, a flowering weedy patch in the field, maybe a late flowering patch of canola or something that would draw the uh, the adults to that area of the field, that could explain why you've got that patch the next season. And I remember one year when I went out to a sunflower field, uh, we had a very heavily distinct patch of cutworms in the field. Um, and the, the grower told me that was last year's thistle patch where we were finding the cutworms. So things can be patchy, scout for that. And if you are applying insecticides, these are nocturnal insects. They hide in the soil during the day and they come up at night. So Spraying later in the day towards the evening is helpful. Uh, one of the questions that I had earlier in the, the winter was, will, if we do have to spray earlier in the day, will we still get control? Uh, if the plants are up and you do make good contact with the emerged plants, 
most of the products for cutworms have enough residual, you should still get decent control, providing it's not a really hot day and you're using a pyrethroid. Uh, if you have to spray earlier, you probably still can get good control. Uh, and there are some products with very good residuals that will give you uh, actually many days of control. So um, evening spraying is best, but if you have to spray early, you probably still can get satisfactory control. And number three on my top four list was army worms. And again, this is not referring to Bertha. This is uh, army worm or serial army worm. This species does have a fairly broad palate. It will feed on lots of things if it has to, but they really like dense grass stands. So the the adult moths, uh, the adult, they don't overwinter here as far as we know. They're Move, they're, they're actually migrating in. I'll, I'll touch on that in a minute. It's a purposeful migration. When they migrate in, which usually we end up seeing them sometime in June, I think this year they probably came in in early June, uh, this past season, they're looking for a, a lush, dense, grassy stand to lay eggs into. So winter cereals, uh, Rye, uh, fall rye, is one of the crops that got really hard hit last year. It would have been ideal for them when they arrived. Nice, dense, grassy stand. Some of the forage grasses, same thing. Uh, they would have been very attractive when the armyworms arrived. And that's where we had probably our worst problems were fall rye, some of the forage grasses, but even some of the um, the annual cereals had quite significant uh, armyworm problems last year. So uh, definitely something to scout for going into next year. Uh, so I've, I'm showing the three stages here. The middle picture is the larval stage. Um, these are fairly fully grown larvae and they belong to the same family of moths as the cutworms. So they have some of this typical cutworm behavior where uh, when you poke at them or disturb them, they just curl up into a ball. So very typical cutworm behavior. In fact, um, they're classified as a type of climbing cutworm, the army worms. So again, very similar to cutworms in some regards. If you're wanting to try to identify the adult moth, it's actually not too hard. They're, they're a uh, very light brown moth, which there's a lot of light brown moths, but if you look on each wing, there's a very small but quite distinct white spot on that wing. So if you're seeing a lot of very light brown moths with these distinct white dots on their wings, that could be army worms. So that could give you a heads up that you need to be looking on the ground for the larva later. And on the right is the pupa stage. I guess on a positive note, um, we did have a lot of parasitism in our first cycle of armyworms last year. When they arrive in June, we often do get two cycles. We see the larva twice. Usually, if they arrive in June, you get a flush of them, of the larva, in July. And usually sometime later in August, you may see the larva a second time. But we barely saw that second flush of larva last year. And I think what might have contributed was a wasp called Cotesia. And so the picture towards the middle with these two small black insects, they're tiny little things. These are Cotesia wasps. And what they do is they lay their eggs into the caterpillars, to the armyworm caterpillars. And when they lay their eggs, it's usually anywhere from about a dozen to maybe 50, 60, or sometimes even more eggs in one caterpillar, and those eggs are all the exact same age. So what does happen, eventually that caterpillar gets pretty full of wasp larvae living inside it, and its behavior changes. They end up climbing to the top of a cereal head, or whatever plant they're on, and then usually end up dying up at the top of the plant. And eventually, uh, just before they die, you get sometimes dozens of these wasp larvae emerging from this, uh, one caterpillar instantaneously. It's actually an uh, interesting spectacle to observe. And within literally 
minutes of emerging, they spin their pupa cases, usually at the top of your cereal heads. I had a lot of people sending me photos in uh, mid to late July last year saying, what are these eggs on the top of the cereal heads? And those aren't eggs, those are pupa clusters of Cotesia. It means you had some good guys working on your armyworm population. The unfortunate thing is the armyworm still had time to do a fair amount of damage in that first uh, generation before the parasites took them down. And once again, this is an insect that we believe doesn't overwinter here and does migrate north in the spring. Uh, the, the, the studies that I guess back up that assertion are one done in Winnipeg uh, by Gord Air back in the 80s. He was keeping wireworms at different temperatures and uh, seeing where they could survive. And uh, if you've even got zero degrees for uh, a series of weeks, they would all die on him. And even four weeks at minus two, they were all dead. So he concluded that they could not survive Canadian prairie conditions. Um, there's a similar study done in Quebec using field cages by Paul Fields. Uh, Paul has recently retired from Ag Canada in Winnipeg. Uh, he studied stored grain insects, but he did his graduate work in Quebec studying armyworms and their overwintering. And uh, same conclusion that they should not be overwintering in this case in Quebec, and that would apply to the Canadian prairies as well. And we do have a lot of good work by Jerry, Jeremy McNeil in Western University in Ontario looking at the migration of armyworms. They do have a purposeful migration north in the spring and a purposeful migration south in the fall. So it's a migratory insect. That's likely how we get them. Um, however, oh, there's always a however in there. Uh, these studies were done in the 80s. Winter conditions have changed a bit since then. We do know that some insects do arrive earlier um, now than they were decades ago. Good example being potato leafhopper, well researched. Uh, whether the same thing is happening with armyworms hasn't really been studied. It would be interesting to find out are they habitually arriving earlier than they were, say, back in the 80s. And the last of my top four, grasshoppers. And again, grasshoppers, we're not talking a species, we're talking a complex. In Manitoba, we've got about roughly 80 species of grasshoppers. There's roughly four that we consider potential pests. And last year, by far the most dominant one was the one on the left of your screen, two-striped grasshopper. And they're an easy one to ID because they're fairly big when they're adults. And they have these two stripes that go right from the back of their eye to the tip of their wings. So that was our dominant species. There is another one, though, that we saw. Um, Interlake seemed to have some big populations of this one, clear winged grasshopper. And they can be confusing because it almost looks like they've got the two stripes as well. You'll notice on the wing, and this is where it gets confusing, they've got these brown splotches on the wings which the two-striped grasshopper doesn't have. So this one's called clear-winged, although it's got these big brown splotches on the wings. So the name does not really uh, fit the insect, it seems. The hind wings are totally clear, and I guess that's what they named it after. I would have called this the brown splotched grasshopper or something. But anyway, clear-winged grasshopper, brown spots. This one is a grass specialist. So. Areas where you do see a lot of this one, it's your cereal grains, your forage grasses that are more at risk. Two-striped grasshopper, they eat a lot of things. So uh, basically any crop you're growing is probably going to be fair game for two-striped grasshopper if they're abundant. And they were the dominant species in a lot of areas last year. And populations, I'll show you in a second some maps, but we've seen an increase in populations over the past few years. Grasshoppers do better under hot, dry summers. And we've had several of those in a row, and the grasshoppers have predictably responded the way we would expect by increasing their populations. And last year, a fair amount of control was needed. 
and especially the pastures, they were really getting hit hard in some areas. Uh, they were being kept from regrowing because of drought in some areas. And then on top of that, you had your grasshoppers. So a lot of people were struggling with, we're dealing with a crop that's not of um, a tremendously high value to begin with. In some cases, it's not growing well, then you got the grasshoppers. And in just a little while, I'll show you a, a strategy that might help you manage them and keep your costs down a little bit. But before we get into that, um, what happened with the population. So every August, we go out and we do grasshopper counts on uh, ditches and field edges, and we try to forecast what might happen the next year. And uh, when I say we, it's usually not me doing too many of them. It's a lot of helpers. Um, your farm production extension specialists, they contribute greatly to this. They're probably the bulk of these. And my summer student, uh, last year my student did quite a bit of driving to uh, get quite a few counts in as well. Uh, like I said, I just maybe do a few, but uh, bulk of this is farm production advisors and summer students. Anyway, what we do is we do counts in August, we map things, and this map, anything in green was our lower counts, things in yellow and orange were our more moderate counts, and we really only had a couple little spots where we had some higher counts. Uh, this is in our August adult survey, but I always worry about people trying to use this map um, maybe incorrectly. Uh, it's a good tool, I think, to see what's happening with our populations. But I think uh, the bigger value of these maps is when we compare them over multiple years. So that's what I've done here. Um, I've got our grasshopper forecast maps from 2016 right through to our 2021 forecast, so our last six years that we did counts. And you can see a trend here. We had our grasshopper populations in the, in the um, uh, from to 20, I'll say 14, 15, somewhere in that range. The populations went really low. We had some very wet early summers, which I think just knocked the population right back. And it took a while for them to start building back again. Um, so 2016, 17, 18 forecasts all green on the maps, really not much yellow at all, very low numbers. Then we started to get these hot, dry summers. We had about four in a row, and you can see what's happened with the grasshopper populations, a lot more yellow and orange on our maps. The 2021 forecast probably doesn't look as daunting as the 2020, but just intuitively based on numbers that I know were out there, um, I think grasshoppers are still one we need to watch really carefully going into 2021, particularly if we get another hot, dry summer. That seems to be a trend that we've been stuck in recently. Grasshoppers don't do as well, especially if we get a lot of rain in um, June when the eggs are hatching, that can really knock them back. Or if we get a lot of rain in August when they're wanting to lay their eggs, that can slow them down sometime as well. Now, regarding what people with pastures can do if they want to keep their costs down, there was research done uh, quite a while back now, actually, at Wyoming, where instead of just treating a whole pasture, they decided we're going to treat it in strips. We'll do 100 feet treated, leave 100 non-treated, treat 100, leave 100. So they did this. And intuitively, you, you might be tempted to think that, well, you're just going to get 50% control. But uh, that really wasn't the result. Um, in many cases, you can still get 80% uh, plus control treating a field this way. I'll show you some data in just a second. And the reason for that, grasshoppers can be very mobile. They move around, uh, especially if you have a product with a bit of residual you will find that give it a week or so and you might find your populations uh, almost gone or at least eliminated 70-80% using this technique. And here's some of the data from these studies. Uh, these are three of the chemicals that they used. 
So carbaryl is your seven. They treated 100% of some pastures with carbaryl, got 94% control. The pastures that they treated 50% of the pasture with carbaryl, they end up with 81% control. So not bad, um, and definitely the most economical way of controlling. Uh, malathion, it was, there was no significant difference between these two numbers. Fipronil, very high residual product. Um, I'll say maybe comparable to our Corrigin. We don't have this one registered here, um, but a very high residual product. They put this one on on one third of the pasture compared to 100%. Their control went from 98 down to 92. So uh, definitely the most economical way if you're using that chemical. Um, so bottom line, using this technique, uh, if you have a crop, they have some pastures that you're hedging, do we control them or not? Uh, this is another option. Instead of spraying the whole pasture, you could do it in strips. Hopefully you will get 80, 90% control like they were in these studies. Um, and that would, in many, in most cases, be the most economical way of treating something, a crop like a pasture. Now I do know anecdotally that people were using this technique in Manitoba the last couple of years on cereals and even soybeans. Uh, again, anecdotally, people told me they thought they got good control. Uh, it hasn't been researched on these crops. Um, I'm hoping that somebody will get that work done at some point. Um, but it is a technique that in, in some situations can save people a bit of money. And also what you are doing using this technique is you're conserving some of the natural enemies of the grasshoppers. Now, uh, wire worms weren't one of my big four, but I'm gonna talk about them anyway because Lionel sent me some questions regarding wire worms. Uh, I know some people in the Southwest had issues last year and Lionel was wondering, what can we do if we've had wire worms the previous season? So we'll address that. So wire worms last year, um, I had a handful of reports of wire worm injury. It wasn't, um, a widespread thing like the flea beetles and grasshoppers and cutworms. But I did have a few reports. The worst case was a field in the eastern region, that a soybean field that was receded because of wireworm injury. And I know there were a few fields in the southwest. I don't know if they were uh, had to be receded at all, but they were at least there was patches that had quite significant damage. So um, still a concern. Um, anyone in, in the Southwest, you may have been approached by Brian Kassan at the University of Brandon about a study he's doing. Uh, he, he was looking for cereal fields to study wireworm populations in, and he's been trapping wireworms for two or three years now, looking at the species that we have in Manitoba. And what we have here is a species, there's no common name, it's called Hypnoides bicolor. It's the one in my photos here. Um, it's not a uh, terribly large wireworm, and individually they don't do as much damage as some of the species further west, like the prairie green wireworm and some of the other species. But when you get big numbers, they still can do significant damage. And uh, just to elaborate on that, we've got roughly about 30 species of wireworms across Canada that can be damaging. But again, in Manitoba, mainly this one species, Hypnoides bicolor. Uh, again, unfortunately, it's not one that um, is as destructive as some other species. But you still do need to keep an eye on things because if you've got some patches that maybe haven't emerged properly and you're seeing a little bit of shredded tissue coming up in the spring, uh, good to be on top of knowing where those wire worm patches are. Now, if, you've, if you're planting a cereal, um, or an oil seed, you do have options for wireworm control. Um, Cruiser is a product, it's uh, in the same, Cruiser is uh, the wireworm version of Helix for flea beetles. It's the same product, uh, diamethoxane. Now, being a neonic, neonics don't do a good job killing wireworms. They will help the crop get off to a good start. And the way they do that, they intoxicate the wireworms. So you got these intoxicated wireworms that basically stop feeding for 
uh, sometimes weeks. And in the meantime, your crop gets off to a good start. But most of those wireworms do recover. So if you're using Cruiser or Stress Shield, uh, the cereals, the product out there now is the Trilex, Trilex Evergo Shield. Uh, that's got imidacloprid, again, a neonic in it. So anything with th those neonic-based products, make the wireworm sick, your crop gets off to a decent start, but you don't necessarily get dead wireworms. So next year, you still have to watch that field. Now, new on the market for this year, we do have two products that uh, actually kill wireworms. And one of them is called Teraxa F4. The F4, I believe, is because it's got four fungicides combined with the active ingredient for wireworms, brophanolide. So this product here, brophanolide, highly toxic to wireworms, kills them. Uh, it's not systemic. So when you, Teraxa F4 is a seed treatment. So when you put this on, um, the plant's germinating, the area around that seed and the seed itself are going to be quite toxic to the wireworm. So if they're coming, they're going to be drawn by the carbon dioxide released from the germinating seed, drawn to the seed. They're probably going to feed either on the seed or the hypocaudal part coming out of the seed. They're going to be killed. Now, the true leaves above the ground probably won't have much, if any, of the teraxa in them, or at least not the um, lofranolide part of it. So uh, you, if you're wondering, will this also control cutworms? Don't expect it, but you can get good wireworm kill using this product. So if, and now wireworms tend to live for several years as larvae in the same field. So if you've had an area that has given you chronic wireworm problems over the past few years, and you're wanting to know how do I actually kill these things, uh, Teraxa would be one option. If you're planting a cereal crop, wheat, barley, oats, rye, um, if you have Teraxa as your seed treatment, uh, you will get wireworm kill. Now, the other use of this active ingredient is as a foliar spray that you apply in the furrow, and this is registered in corn and potatoes for wireworm control. So same active, brophanolide. The product's called Semigra, and you would spray it right into the furrows when you're planting your corn or your potatoes. And in corn, it also will kill corn rootworm. So we don't, uh, we, we usually, for corn rootworm, we usually tell people just rotate your crop. Crop rotation gives you pretty much 100% kill. But I realize there's some people that don't like rotating their corn and have gotten some bad rootworm problems. So this would be one option for you. This and there are some um, BT rootworm varieties. Now, just so you're um, calling a wireworm a wireworm and not mistaking other things for wireworms, I wanted to include this slide here because the past few years I've had a lot of people sending me photos of these pale white larvae that they're finding in the fields, wondering, are these wireworms? Short answer, no. These are cerevids. Now, there's other white, wormy-like things in the fields. If it's a very small, just a few millimeters long, it could be an enchitrid worm, which breaks down your organic matter. Not a problem. If it's a bit longer, if it looks like it's um, maybe an inch or two long, uh, pretty much wireworm-sized, but very active is probably a therivid or stiletto fly larva. Stiletto fly is the common name, therivid is the scientific name for this group. And uh, yeah, this group, um, very active. If you poke at them, they go snaky. They're predators. That's why they're quick. And they feed on things such as wireworms. So if it's therivid that you're seeing a lot of, that's good. You don't need to use brophanolide. They're eating the wireworms that you do have. And I just want to finish by touching on a couple insects that um, is that we're keeping an eye on currently. They're newer insects in the province. And I just want to make sure that people are aware um, of what these are in case you do start seeing them. 
So the first of the two I'm going to cover is cabbage seed pod weevil. And I've also included pollen beetle in my title. We've never ever found a pollen beetle in Manitoba. We are looking for them. They're a pest of canola in the eastern part of Canada. They are not in the Canadian prairies, but we are looking. We're also keeping an eye on cabbage seed pod weevil, which we have been finding, but only at very low numbers and only in the last few years. So cabbage seed pod weevil has been a big concern in Alberta and then Saskatchewan. In recent years, it has moved into Manitoba, but we can barely find it. We have to look really, really hard. And last year, we picked 26 canola fields and each field we went out to, I say we, my summer student Shelby did most of the work, I did a little. Um, anyway, we uh, did three sets of 25 sweeps in each of these 26 fields. We caught a total of seven cabbage seed pod weevils. That is not a high number. Um, you'd have to have uh, about four or more seed pod weevils every time you do a set of these sweeps for it to be a problem. The fact that we can only find seven in 26 fields means they're here, they're at low levels, they're not economical at this point, but there's something we want to keep an eye on. And we want to keep an eye both on the levels that we're finding and also the range. So far, we've been finding them areas around um, Melita. We had a, a few found in the Hamiota area. We found one up in that area. I think it was Laurier was the community up in that McCreary area. That's the furthest north we've ever found them. And that was just an individual specimen. Uh, most that we found were more in that Melita up to Hami Oda area. That seems to be where we're finding them. But again, really tiny numbers. Now, if you're out there sweeping your canola and you get a lot of these really tiny beetles, Save them, send them to me, let me know. Uh, that would be good information for us. We may come out and do a, uh, a set of our 25 sweeps just to verify what's in that field. Um, they're tiny, three to four millimeters long, so they're not a big weevil. Uh, but again, let me know if you do start seeing those. And number two on my invasive list that I just want people to keep an eye on is pea leaf weevil. Pea leaf weevil, first found in 2019 by a keen agronomist up near Swan River. She noticed some in um, some of the uh, late summer um, re-sprouting peas in the area. Sent me the weevils, they were pea leaf weevil. So last year we put out pheromone baited traps looking for them. We had these set up throughout the northwest and southwest. Uh, we did find some but very low numbers just like for the Seed pod weevil, we found them in Kenville, that Swan River area, Minnetonas, and as far east as Dauphin in the northwest. So as far as we know right now, pea leaf weevil is just in the northwest. We could not detect it in the southwest. So uh, either it's there in really no low numbers and we just haven't detected it yet or has it moved down to the southwest. But it is in that northwest. And again, we're keeping an eye on both range and numbers. I don't think we're at a point where you need to be using seed treatments to manage them, but it's worth keeping an eye on what's happening in your area. If you do notice a lot of, again, these tiny weevils, this one's got three white stripes going down the back, but they are tiny. If you're not sure, send me a sample. Even if you are sure, send me a sample because we are trying to track where these weevils are present. And what they do, the actual weevil doesn't do much. They just make these little um, notches in the ends of the leaves. So these notches really aren't going to affect your yield. They will just tip you off that the weevils in your area. It's the larva that does the damage. And what they're doing is they're feeding on the nodules growing on your roots. The nodules are what produces the nitrogen. They've got the symbiotic um, microbes that produce nitrogen. And these larvae are eating those nodules. So um, you'll still get a plant, and the plant will uh, still grow uh, maybe decently well, but it'll, they won't be getting the nitrogen that it needs. So you'll essentially have a nitrogen-deficient pea plant if you have a lot of these. So that's why we need to keep an eye on this one. And just to close with, uh, a couple newer insecticides once again. 
Uh, closer, this is a selective product for sap feeding insects. It had a label expansion to include ligus bugs on quinoa. I don't know if there's too many quinoa growers in the West, but uh, if you are and you've had trouble with ligus bugs, closer could be a solution. And a new one that's probably got more of a horticulture use, so probably more potatoes, maybe corn, um, the ego. This is in the same group as your corrigens and your lumiderms, so that diamide group, the active ingredients Tetranilla Pro. This product has a, uh, quite a long residual, similar to what you'd expect from a corrigen. Um, it, probably its main use will be in potatoes for potato beetles and um, some of the other insects there. It is registered for corn borer as well, particularly sweet corn growers who want something with a long residual, could be an option for them. And it's also registered for cutworms in soybeans. And if you're wondering, uh, we used to be uh, just using Desus 5 EC as our main formulation. There's a new one on the market called Desus 100 EC. It's basically Desus at twice the strength. So you will use roughly half the rate. So that's Desus 100 EC. So that's new on the market this year. And there's a new version of Promethrin on the market called Ipco Synchro. Promethrin, that's your, um, uh, your Ambush, your Pounce, those products. That is Promethrin. This is a new generic version of those. So uh, looking back, we did have our cutworms and a few bad issues, but we had a lot that didn't happen. Soybean aphids, barely saw them last year. Uh, last bad year was 2017. They arrived late and they really didn't amount to much. The, the aphids that affect cereals, they also blow in, barely saw those. So aphids weren't, aside from a few pea fields, aphids re really weren't a big problem last year. Wheat midge levels still seem to be contained quite well here. I think Macroglease Penetrans is doing a good job. I'm going to go back a slide here. Our parasite Macroglease Penetrans, I think, is doing a good job keeping them in check. Corn borer, I was looking for some for a survey I was doing. I had trouble finding the eggs. We did find some in some quinoa. Um, so I got enough larva for my study, but so not quinoa, a millet. Uh, we, we collected some from a millet field. Um, but in corn, levels seemed to be quite low last year. And after leafhopper just didn't arrive in levels that could do much. So in summary, Keep an eye open for flea beetles, cutworms, grasshoppers going into next year. Those are probably the biggest concerns. Grasshoppers have been increasing. We really got to watch that one. And if you do see any cabbage seed pod weevil or pea leaf weevils, let me know. I'd be really interested. And I should end with that because I realize we're getting close to 10 and I want to save room for questions if we do have any. Okay, John. Uh, yeah, we do have a few questions here. So. Um... First question, uh, we'll go back to the start. Uh, with uh, Buteo start, uh, any work, uh, will it have any uh, any activity on cutworms? Not that I'm aware of. Um, the Yeah, no, the, it's not registered for cutworms. And I'm skeptical just based on what I know the, um, the, the act of, as a foliar version is registered for. Um, so at this point, um, I'm going to say uh, uncertain, but uh, skeptical about it having cutworm activity. So basically, you're just extending your flea beetle control. You're extending your flea beetle control exactly. That's all you'd be. That's why you'd want to be using it right now. It's for the extended flea beetle control. If you're wanting cutworm control as well, uh, definitely go with something like the Lumiderm or Fratenza Advanced. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, this is uh, when you were just, uh, talking about uh, overwintering, and the question is, if insects don't overwinter, how are they still found in fields? Okay, um, I guess I should uh, clarify. Um, overwinter in Manitoba. So I was talking about armyworms, and they do overwinter in the southern U.S. and further south even. Uh, they don't overwinter close to our borders, so I probably phrase that wrong. They overwinter, but just not in the Canadian prairies. So they have to migrate in every year for us to get them. And the same with 
things like um, some of our aphid species, um, diamondback moth would be another one. They may overwinter poorly in Manitoba, but if they're going to be a problem, they're blowing in. Okay, and just uh, add on to that question, um, and I don't want to jinx our weather here, but the question is, uh, with the weather we have been ha getting, will this have any effect on some of the insect issues this spring? Yeah, that that's actually a really good question, and there's two things we have to consider. There's, um, it's been mild, uh, generally speaking. I know we've we've got a cold snap coming up, and uh, so cold cold definitely is a, a big factor, but probably equally bigger, if not bigger, is snow cover, and snow is a really good insulator, even. Um, you know, five, 10 centimeters of snow covering the ground can provide good insulation. And some insects are quite susceptible to uh, the freezing. And usually the only time they get it is years when we have next to no snow. Um, so uh, that being said, if we continue to have bare ground and we do get a week or two of bitter cold, say minus 30s, which I believe is on its way, that could result in winter kill of some insects. The ones that seem to be vulnerable, Bertha armyworm, uh, Bob Lamb did great studies back in the 80s where they actually went and cleared a snow off of plots of land and compared survival in cleared plots versus uh, non-cleared, and there was a, a dramatic difference. So that was Bertha armyworm. Um, some of the other cutworm species may also be affected. Flea beetles, um, my gut feeling is probably not. They're overwintering more in sheltered areas underneath uh, debris, uh, areas that often do trap whatever snow is around. Be nice if we got some winter kill, but don't count on it for flea beetles. Better odds for cutworms and possibly um, uh, Bertha armyworm, not that it was a big deal. Uh, grasshoppers, they can be killed by cold weather, but it needs to get down to about minus 15 degrees where the eggs are laid. And so they, they require quite cold soil temperatures to kill them. Uh, if your winter wheat survives, probably the grasshopper eggs will. And also grasshoppers lay their eggs in areas like uh, field edges, ditches, where often snow does accumulate. So uh, again, tough one to call, but if we get some fairly bare ground and bitter cold, uh, that could help us out in some regards. Okay, and uh, one more, and this is uh, back to the uh, grasshoppers uh, when you were talking about the control. And uh, so uh, the question is, when is the best time to uh, to spray for grasshoppers? Hey, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, now, definitely keep an eye on the levels, and even when they're young nymphs, if you've got really excessive damage happening, you have to prevent that. But if you can hold off until they've at least got wing buds, which moves them into their later juvenile instars, their uh, third, fourth, and fifth. Um, as a general guideline, once most of them have wing buds, egg hatch is pretty much complete. And then one application uh, should give you fairly good control. The danger of going in too early is if you go in before egg hatch is complete, you could spray, and depending on what you use, you could spray, and then you have this other, things are still hatching out. You've got another flush of grasshoppers that you then have to deal with again. So we usually encourage people, if you can, wait until they're in their later juvenile stages till they have wing buds. The danger of waiting until they're all adults is they're more mobile. When they, ha when they have their wings coming to the back of their abdomen and they can fly, they're an adult, they're much more mobile and the products don't work as well against adults as they do their late juveniles. So late juvenile is ideal. Um, adult and really young, if you have to, you have to, but they're not the preferred timings. Okay, and one question I had here, so um, regarding grasshoppers, so the hatch is going to happen at a certain time, or is it weather-related? 
Hatch is somewhat weather related uh, because right now grasshoppers are, are, are all our pest species are in the ground as eggs. They've had a little bit of heat accumulation or, or de degree day development already, but they need a certain number of what we call degree days before they will hatch. And so that depends on how warm that spring is. A warmer spring, they hatch earlier. And everything is a bit species dependent too. Uh, the clear wing grasshopper, the one that's the cereal specialist, they will hatch out with fewer degree days than the two-striped grasshopper. So it depends on your dominant species as well. Um, but yeah, you, you, it does depend on the heat. Uh, a warmer spring will mean earlier hatch for the grasshoppers. And just the other thing I'm going to throw in, uh, a lot of people uh, often ask about if we get a lot of snow and the ditches are all flooded in the spring, will that kill them? And the short answer, no, the eggs are very, very water resistant. Uh, when they're in the egg stage, flooded ditches and field edges won't kill them. Once they hatch, though, they're very vulnerable to excess moisture. So uh, that's why very heavy rains in early June can sometimes be a real threat. Okay, well, thanks, John. That was, uh, again, a real good presentation. Uh, get us up to date as to what we can uh, maybe expect for this spring and good uh, good resources there too. So thanks again for being on. And uh, uh, again, uh, good a lot of good questions as well. So with that, okay, I've got a, with that, I've got a couple of slides left to finish off. Uh, here's the contact information for our farm production extension specialists in the province. Uh, again, if you've got questions regarding any of the things we're talking about uh, on Crop Talk, uh, if you can get a hold of myself or get a hold of any of these uh, these specialists, they'll be able to help you with any of your questions. Uh, I just received this uh, this morning, and so if anybody uh, is uh, looking for uh, a summer research uh, position or uh, has maybe uh, uh, someone that's going to university that was looking for a summer job, uh, WADO, so that's out of uh, Melita, uh, Westman Ag Diversification Organization are looking is looking for a summer research assistant. So really good for uh, somebody that's interested in agriculture or, and uh, wanting to do uh, research and small plot machinery. So uh, there's a contact information and Scott Chalmers is the manager there and uh, get your applications into him. And uh, your certified crop advisor information, you can send that info into Lori Forbes. And we're gonna take a week off and we'll be back again for the next crop talk on February the 17th. So uh, thanks for attending today and see everybody back again on the 17th.